So this morning's session, the first speaker is John Francis from Northwestern University, who will talk to us about modular spaces of stratifications and factorization. <coughs> Thanks very much uh, for the introduction and the invitation to speak. It's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, it's been fun for me to um, listen to all of these talks, but especially the ones yesterday in which factorization homology was used. So this talk, in some sense, will be maybe an introduction uh, to yesterday's talks. <laughs> um, or maybe the, the first half will be an introduction to yesterday's talks, and then the second half will be an introduction to future talks of those same speakers. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so... Um, so, there's a general recipe in this, or a meta for factorization homology, because there are a bunch of versions of this theory. I was going to put recipe, but meta fits better there. Um, and I should say that all of this is joint with David I. This recipe has a few ingredients. Uh, there's one geometric ingredient that, for this whole lecture, I'll denote x, almost always. And x will always have dimension equal to n. And exactly what kind of geometry x might have will vary depending on which version of the the theory we're, we're interested in. The second ingredient will be algebraic or categorical. We all call this C for the sort of algebraic coefficients. And this will be some piece of algebra. And what kind of algebra or, or category theoretic data C will constitute will depend on X and especially on n. So it'll be um, sensitive to this geometry that isn't specified. So these are the two ingredients. So once you have these two ingredients, then there should be a construction. So the construction will be um, of a, a sheaf or a co-sheaf we all call this F sub C on some auxiliary space that I am just now mentioning for the first time that I'll denote M sub X. So here we get to the, the basic Kind of philosophy or you know um, sort of pie in the sky outlook of this subject which is that the the slogan is that everything should satisfy this set on some moduli space m sub x so there should be some kind of a universal really interesting moduli space associated to x such that whatever you want to study on x it might not satisfy a local to global principle on x itself but it should on M sub X. So everything is a sheet for a co-sheet for the, the global sections thereof of something on M sub X. So you might ask, well, what is M sub X? And we'll, we'll get to that eventually. So that's the construction. There's some auxiliary space, which is maybe going to be complicated, maybe not. Um, and, uh, and this is the thing that you construct. So maybe, uh, C, I'll say that this is algebraic, and there'll be some kind of um, relative to some V. So V could be chain complexes, or V could be like homotopy types, or spaces, something like that. 
All right, so once you do this, what do you get? Well, now you can define factorization homology. Factorization homology, which we'll just, this is just notation, we're going to use this integral sign. The factorization homology of x with coefficients in c, that's just the words associated to this symbol, this will then be defined um, as the, well if this was, a, I'll say it was, this was a cosheaf, then the, the global cosection, you know, the, the, the homology of this cosheaf, of m sub x with coefficients in f sub c. And I've written it in this way, a uh, suggestive way of homology, but the, whether you'd really want to think of that as like a chain complex or a graded or bidding group would depend on if you set b to be chain complexes. So that's just notation, but it's the derived uh, global co-sections, and this will always be an object in b. So it'll be a chain complex if b was chain complexes. It'll be a space if b was Okay, so that's the output of the, the recipe. Yeah. So now this uh, this output has a few features, which is what um, makes it all uh, worthwhile. And I know that this space is illegal, but I'm going to use it anyway. Uh, so if y'all in the back want to stand up. <laughs> uh, Um, okay, so the first feature that this has is that it's well defined. <coughs> um, and so if we manage to make some contact with other kinds of approaches to uh, topological field theory, often there are approaches in which uh, you know, you choose some generators, like a handle presentation, and then you have some explicit thing that you do, and then you have to check that something is well defined. So you don't have to do that here, or rather, similar work is packaged into this construction. But once you do that construction, that's supposed to take care of all well definedness issues once and for all. So it's well defined, whatever it is. That's one feature. Uh, the next feature. I'll call this uh, E, is that, well, since something had to do with uh, sheaf theory on some space, you can now make local to global arguments on that space. In other words, you know, by very nature of this definition, it satisfies excision on M sub X. So you have Meyer Viatoris sequences, you have whatever this space was, you can do excision on that. So I'll call that E for excision. Um, and I'll call this, you now have this thing that we'll, I'll call tensor excision uh, for reasons that will become clearer later. Sorry, you said excision on M sub X rather than excision on X? That's right, we thought this was a sheaf on M sub X. So this thing, what kind of ex what excision means depend on what M sub X was. If M sub X was a point, then excision is pretty boring. Um, but it just will, this in general will not satisfy excision on X in the usual. All right, so that's one feature, E. Um, the next feature that I won't uh, talk about too much is that, well, this again has to do with the geometry of M sub X, and M sub X will naturally carry filtrations. So you'll also have filtrations associated, again, to the geometry of M sub X, and these filtrations lead to spectral sequences and computations. And I won't talk about that too much, but it's there. And then the last feature, which maybe is my favorite, but you know, I like them all, um, is uh, M sub X, if you don't know it now, it'll become something really infinite dimensional, but it'll have some residual finite dimensional manifold features. In particular, it'll be, you'll be able to make some partial sense of Poincaré duality on M sub X. So there's some hidden source of duality 
which is uh, is sort of the maybe unexpected outcome for taking something and putting it into this theory. So you have some kind of infinite dimensional Verdier duality on this space <laughs> MCX that I'll call for reasons that are not yet apparent, Poincaré physical duality. Okay, so this is the recipe, um, and now I'm going to uh, go through this recipe in a little more detail in, in, two, in the alpha version of the theory, and then the beta version of the theory. Um, any questions before I, I start that? For those of you who can't see, should I repeat B, F, or D, or does everyone have them? All right, so the alpha version. So in the alpha version, um, the difference between the alpha version and the beta version, the fundamental thing will be what is m sub x. So in the alpha version, m sub x this alpha and beta in the center of software development or well <laughs> they're, just, they're just letters uh alpha and omega <laughs> yeah yeah no uh, yes yes yeah, so does that mean we shouldn't get trust data then pardon me um you know trust is so <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean i it's hard for me to express sufficient skepticism at this moment uh, when you talk about trust. <laughs> um, all right, so in the alpha version of this theory, this is known as the Ron space of X. And the idea uh, to use the Ron space in this way is an idea of balancing a threat type. So let me tell you what the Ron space is. So first, <coughs> let me just remind you what the definition is, just a fixed notation of configuration spaces. So x here is a... Um, x here will be either an algebraic variety or a smooth manifold. Um, it won't make too much difference for what I'm about to say. Although in the beta version of the theory, it will make a lot of difference, but for right now it doesn't. So the configuration space of k distinct um, ordered points in X is the uh, subspace of X to the k, all k tuples, such that no two points are the same. So whenever i and j are distinct, then the i element and the j element are also distinct. So note that that has an action of the symmetric group, sigma k, and if you take the quotient by sigma k, that's the unordered k tuples of distinct points. So the ring space, the run space of x as a set, let's say first I'll say this is for x connected, definition as a set is just the set of all uh, finite non-empty subsets of X. So in other words, it is the union of the configuration spaces of K points on order. So that's what it is as a set. And now we endow it um, with an <coughs> inobvious topology. And in this topology, uh, points are allowed to collide in a continuous way. So this will not just be the disjoint union of these spaces. Um, they'll be glued together in such a way as when you take two points which live in, say, con 2, and you bring them together, and then they meet in a diagonal, so they become the same, then that's actually a continuous path in this space. Whereas, of course, it's not a continuous path in the disjoint. 
So this will be given the uh, strongest topology. such that the following maps are all continuous. So for any finite set i, um, there's a map of sets from x to the i to the Ron set of x that sends um, what I'll call the image. Uh, so this sends, given some i-tuple uh, in x, send it to the image of x as a subset of x. So note that this map um, goes to different components here. If all of the image points were distinct, then it would go to well, whatever the cardinality of i was. If they were all the same, then it would go to k or be equal to 1. So this map, of course, would not be continuous if I gave this the topology of the disjoint unit. So we'll give this the strongest, finest topology, whichever word you like such that all of these maps, where i is finite and non-empty, all of these maps are continuous. So in other words, a subset of this space is open if and only if its inverse image in x to the i is open for every i, such that this is continuous. So this is a, a historical, it's not an abbreviation, um, or maybe it's an abbreviation for the same brand. Um, so the, the history of this space is that it was first called the, it was introduced by Borsuk and Ulam in the 1930s, and they called it the symmetric product. Um, and topologists don't like to call it the symmetric product now because the symmetric product means something different. It takes as input a pointed space and it outputs a different space whose homotopy groups are the homology of X, and this is the, one of the basic object in dull Tom theory. It's kind of related to this space, but the relation is, um, is not super obvious. So this is a, a different space. Um, this it was uh, um, studied again uh, in the 50s by Bott, and then studied again in the 70s by some other people, and then studied again by Balanson and Drinfeld, as well as Zivron in the 90s. Um, and Bellinson and Drinfeld credit Zivron for being the first one to introduce the, um, to recognize the value of the algebraic geometric analog of this space um, in algebraic geometry for classical algebraic geometry problems. So Bellinson and Drinfeld are nice guys and they gave Zivron some credit and so we call it the Ron space. Can you translate this discussion here into algebraic geometry or do you have to do other things? Uh, it's pretty close. So, so this right here defines a functor from uh, finite sets and surjections to stacks and take the co-limit of that functor. And that's if I said that in topological spaces, then the two definitions would match up exactly. I like to say it this way because, you know, some of the other stuff I say is kind of like scary higher categorical, and this is like my one moment to be like actual topological spaces. Okay, any questions about the definition of this actual topological space? <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. Exactly, this is the, the co-limit of that diagram in topological spaces. Okay, so this, this space is kind of uh, infinite dimensional, but it sort of it has this filtration with finite dimensional layers, right? The, it has a filtration by cardinality. Here's that, that F point, and the layers are these finite dimensional manifolds. So it's, uh, it's a little bit of an intimidating space in some ways, but at the same time, you know, it's sort of, it has ways of accessing it. All right, so... Um, so then there's the issue of this uh, construction. So there are a few different constructions. And the number of is compressible? Uh, yeah, it has some. So how is it going to be? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
so so it is contractible. So if you were interested in the homology of constant sheaves on this space, that would be pretty easy. However, the kinds of sheaves that we'll be interested in are the kinds of co-sheaves will not be constant. And so uh, you shouldn't really think of it as being contractible. Rather, you should think of it as being filtered. And as a filtered topological space, it is not a contractible filter. It's not, it's non-trivial. <laughs> But if you're not intimidated, it's great. I don't, I don't want to convince you to be intimidated. Uh, OK, so now what kinds of algebra, what kinds of coefficient systems can we get on this space? So um, Yeah, and I won't mention it. But if you'd like to see a reference, there's a paper by uh, Lauren Van Clater, which proves the Dalton theorem using the kinds of ideas that I'll talk about today. So it's a, it's a, it's a different proof than Dalton. Can you write the name of the person? Oh, uh, sure. And, uh, so you can see. Um, So there's uh, so what kinds of how do we construct interesting uh, co-sheets on this space? So there's a um, so let me call disk and the, the topological category where the objects are this are uh, Finite disjoint unions of Euclidean space, and the morphisms are open embeddings. So a um, a n disk algebra. A symmetric conoidal functor and B is a symmetric conoidal functor from disk and B. So in other words, one which sends, I'll also write A for just a value on a single Rn. So it sends um, this to the object. value on a single Rn tensor with itself i times. So we call this an algebra because clearly its, its value on any of these objects is determined by its value on one object. And then there's some extra structure, like there's a map from the uh, embeddings of two copies of Rn. to the space of maps in V from A tensor 2 to A. So given any choice of such an embedding, you get a multiplication on A. And there's the algebra structure. Um, and this space, uh, so, so there, this space um, kind of fibers over the circle. So there are two kinds of, uh, there's two kinds of topology you see here. There's also, maybe I should have put this, a map from embeddings from Rn to Rn just to palms from A to itself. And this has the homotopy type of the orthogonal group. So the orthogonal group clearly sits inside there, and there is a retraction by, say, taking a derivative and translating to the origin. Um, you know, so you grad students, in my opinion, that this is one of the, one of the most fundamental facts in differential topology, which is the least taught. Um, so, 
hearing it from me for the first time, you're welcome. <laughs> well, he heard it from me. <laughs> <laughs> fundamental and it's inside of uh, topology from a differentiable viewpoint it's just not set exactly but there's a proof of one lemma in there which is essentially the same as the proof of this but it's, it's actually not as easy to find in the literature as it should be kind of weird um okay so a has an action of the orthogonal group and um in addition to that sitting inside here this is a uh quotient by the action of the, the orthogonal groups on this space, you get a map to SN minus 1, so you should also think that A has, um, where there's a map from SN minus 1 to this space, just given by taking fixed embeddings of Rn and Rn and rotating it around the origin, so A actually also has an SN minus 1 worth of multiplications. So those are the two things you should sort of think of. So the um, so these endisk algebras are the same thing as, uh, if you're familiar with EN algebras, then there's an action of the orthogonal group on the category of EN algebras, and the suitably defined ON fixed points of this action are equivalent to um, N disk algebras. So EN algebras are equivalent to the same, everything that I just said here, except where I put a frame in front of here. So I only allow frame embeddings suitably defined. All right, so then the, the construction here. So we can construct from, um, I'll just free you with these uh, N-disk algebras. So if I'm given an N-disk algebra, On um, the the Ron space of, of X, where X is a smooth and manifold. So the, the since I mentioned Bellinson and Drinkfeld, who introduced this first in algebraic geometry, um, I won't say too much about this. But given a suitable uh, vertex operator algebra. Quasi conformal vertex operator algebra. There's also a construction which motivated this whole story. Um, of a D module on the algebra geometric version of this space when C is an algebra. Alright, so th these are the constructions. Um, and the, maybe let me just briefly spell this out in the example n equals 1. So let's say, in this case, um, uh, let's just say that A is an algebra, an associative algebra. And so this Cauchy has some features. Let me just tell you. This is a, a, a constructible Cauchy with respect to the stratification by cardinality on the round space. And so this has the feature that if you look at its co-stock, really? yes. I'm, I'm very confused. Shouldn't it be like an, an algebra and an involution in that case, something like that? Yeah, it will be. Okay, sorry. You're not confused. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so this will be the tensor product of uh, A with itself at the time. So that's what the co-stocks are. So on every layer, you look at the configuration space of, of K on order of points, 
then a stop over any such point at the algebra tensor with itself k times. So you see that these layers change as the cardinality change, but if you fix the cardinality, then you just get something constant. So a constructible, you should think about a, a constructible Cauchy finding the space as being, well, what it is on each layer, and then the extra data of the co-specialization max. So in other words, if you give yourself a little path that moves between layers, you should you get a map from the co-stock from the generic co-stock to the special co-stock. So what is that? So what could it be? Well, it'll be, let's say that the path, we gave some little path in the range space of R. I guess I should have said that this was going to happen on R. There are not that many one manifolds, so it would be R or S1. Here, if you give yourself a co-specialization map that moves from a generic value of two distinct points uh, to the special value in which these two merge at the third point, Z, I could draw this this way. Uh, here's my picture of a path from the round space that's just concentrated in the lesser equal to two part. So then there should be some map from the, the co-stock or the, the generic co-stock to the special co-stock, and this will be the map A tensor 2 maps to A, which is the multiplication. So as was just pointed out a moment ago, how do you know it's the multiplication and not the opposite of the multiplication? Well, um, so there you either need to have chosen a framing or you need an involution on A, depending on which way the path goes. In other words, whether they merge like this, for instance, let's say they form a circle, or they merge like this. So um, let's just sweep that one under the rug, and let's just say that either one of these were framed or oriented. In which case, the orientation tells us which way these two points should go. So given an orientation R and S1 in algebra, we can construct a Cauchy, um, where the co-specialization maps are defined by the multiple. Any questions about uh, the n equals one case? All right, so um, I said that this had a virtue of being well defined. So why is that, um, or where is the, 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 the virtuousness of that here? So one, um, this kind of structure of being um, such an algebra is obtained by the local observables in a TFT. So if you have some topological field theory that you can define um, on Rn, so let me call the value of the observables on Rn, obs Rn, then there exists a natural map from this factorization homology to the global observables um, on X. So it, you might um, you might be, for instance, attempting to define this if you were trying to construct things mathematically. And this is now just some algebraic object that maybe is, is easier to define. Or maybe you're trying to calculate this. And now this is some object that is potentially easier to calculate, um, and you have Sort of tools for saying what this left hand object is, but in any case, there's some kind of an assembly map which takes uh, the, these sort of local observables pieced together in any possible way and constructs a global observable from it. So there's there's something well defined like that. Um, in the algebra geometric case, <coughs> is this map the equivalence or? I'll get to that. <coughs> in the algebra geometric case, where we're doing the, uh, something coming from the VOA that I'll just denote VOA, over C, um, so that's some new, new and interesting object, and H0 of it are the conformal blocks. 
of the of a chiral conformal field here. So this is what motivated um, Bounds and Grunfeld to give a, a purely algebra geometric construction uh, of the conformal blocks of a CFT. A little confusing notation. Uh, in this case, C is both pure and uh, no, 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 no. These are totally different C's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. This Maybe is an Euler script, yeah. Yeah. and um, this is yeah. well. I guess you can't tell if it's sans serif or whatever. In any case, it's not a relation. What is V? Uh, v? No, the the curly V. <laughs> yeah, uh, v is, is chain complexes in this case. Chain complexes are what? What are these conformal? The conformal blocks uh, are in a Bielian group. This is a chain complex. I take H0 of it, I get an Abelian group or a vector space, uh, and those are the conformal blocks of the CFT. <laughs> okay, so that's good. <coughs> Now, what about these other features that I, I, I said were, were good, such as excision, filtrations, concrete to zoo duality? So excision in this case uh, has the following meaning. If you cut X up along a co-dimension one submanifold, X zero, then you can calculate this value So x0 is the co-dimension 1 sub-manifold, and if you choose some trivialization r of the normal bundle, then you can make sense of this uh, derived two-sided tensor product. And this has the structure of an algebra, and these two things are modules. And this global value can be, um, can be calculated from this, uh, this derived tensor product, and that is one example of how excision works on the round space. So in other words, on the round space you can you can sort of divide up any tuple as tuples in one half, tuples in the other half, and then the data of how you move points sort of along this intermediary part. And that description allows you to say that a, a sort of such an object on the on the round space that the co-global sections need to, to abide by such an expression. So that gives you a, a local to global method for computing factorization homology that was, was used in, um, in some of the, the work yesterday. So thanks you guys for using that. Um, so that's, that's one thing. There are filtrations. Uh, so the filtrations won't play a role in what I'm going to say, but they're, they're very useful. For instance, this sort of thing has been used in classical topology for computing the homology of mapping spaces, and often those filtrations um, split stably. And so this gives you kind of the, the state of the art uh, calculations in computing the homology of a mapping space when the source is an end manifold and the target is sufficiently connected at least. So now, um, my my favorite, at least at the moment, uh, concrete Kazoo duality. How does this work? So there's a map given uh, suitable A. There's a map. You can take the linear dual of this. And there's a map from the factorization homology of the Kazoo dual. And so it turns out that Kazool duality, there's such a thing as Kazool duality for EN or N-disk algebras, and that has to do with gradient duality on, um, on the, the round space of, uh, of an N-manifold. And there's a map from the, between these factorization laws, between the linear dual of, of the thing you started with and the other one, and this map is, um, is sometimes an equivalence. And so the general thing is that this should 
this allows you to uh, exchange the sort of interchanges values. So if, if, uh, if, if one of these things, if A was defining some kind of a field theory, then there would be some dual field theory uh, defined by the Krizul dual of A, and this would be telling you that the, the values, if this map were an equivalence, that would be telling you that the values like on the uh, n minus 1 or the up to the top dimension were linearly dual, and then the numerical values that you got at the top were equal, or at least up to convergence issues. So let me... Uh, Tell you sort of a, a sort of a kind of a neat, just briefly sketch kind of a neat example of how this works. Seriously, why would you put why would we call that Poincaré duality? We haven't done anything to the underlying manifold X. Well, we don't usually do anything to the underlying manifold in Poincaré duality, um, <laughs> but there is something you could do to it. So when I wrote this, X was a closed manifold. Um, so there's a, if X was non-compact. Then there's a version where one of these sides is a compactly supported band. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe that's what you had in mind by doing something on the one side, mm -hmm. in which case you're right. Um, okay, so so let me tell you a, a kind of a neat example or something which closely fits into this Poincare Kazoo duality framework. So there's a construction given a, say, a, a simple Lie algebra with a non-degenerate um, invariant pairing. So you can construct um, a, an uh, E3 algebra. So let me call this. Uh, Is Q of G. Um, so this is some some Q deformation of Lie algebra cohomology. So Lie algebra cochains has a commutative algebra structure. You can deform that over a formal parameter, a formal parameter, um, as an E3 algebra, and that's an interesting E3 algebra. So it's actually a filtered E3 algebra, but let me not get into the filtered part. Uh, so there's such a construction that. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Kevin Costo and Owen Gilliam, I worked out a really long time ago, <laughs> but this paper is finally going to appear, so I, I, I can kind of, um, I, I feel honest about putting this up on the board again, like this summer, for real, for real this time. <laughs> uh, so there's uh, such a construction. Now, uh, this whole story, I haven't mentioned it, is natural with respect to open embeddings. So then there's, you can take the, the factorization homology of the circle, and I should have said this over here, but for that, factorization homology of the circle in this case uh, is the Hoch shield chain, or equivalent quasi-symmorphic to the Hoch shield chains. And so you can think about this factorization homology theory as being a higher dimensional generalization of Hoch shield homology, at least when your algebraic inputs are some higher, higher dimensional generalization of associative algebras, like the ENL. So Hochschild homology, um, you can calculate the Hochschild homology of this Q deformation of Lie algebra cohomology, and it, given, it carries, um, uh, given a, a representation of G, you can construct an element that traces B by the usual uh, trace construction uh, with living in Hochschild homology. So if you like the Dennis trace map from K theory to Hochschild homology. Um, so now, given K a knot, a framed knot, there's a map from this to the value on R3 of C3 of G, which is just equivalent to C3 of G. And so you can take this map and evaluate it on this element. And this gives you 
common element in degree zero. Uh, over here, maybe I'll call this factorization homology of K. So this gives you factorization homology of K of the trace of V. This is an element. And you could be like, well, this is a knot invariant now. What is the knot invariant? And so the theorem is that this is the uh, Reshetikin Chirayev invariant. So, an instance of, I know you can't see this, so I won't write much. So, an instance of Poincare Crizul duality here is that this invariant, given by factorization homology, is the uh, Reshetikin Chirayev invariant. Associated to the same data, um, where the, the formal parameter for the quantum group. Um, and so, the the reason, roughly speaking, that you could think of this as as uh, as Poincaré Crizul duality is that this is roughly you should think of this as being the Crizul rule of the quantum group. And Poincaré Crizul duality interchanges values between these Crizul dual sides. So, roughly speaking, the Reshetikin and Chirayev theory takes as input the quantum group. Uh, this takes as input the Crizul dual side. And this theorem says that, uh, well, this, this fits into the Poincaré Crizul duality framework that interchanges values. This is that state. Okay, we can use the in line D, X is the same on both sides. And then below, we have X1, R2. Um, so there's a, a variant of all of this theory in which, say, K X, you know, has a knot in it or something like that. So that's the that's the version down here. So manifolds with submanifolds, and then this is a, a flexible theory. So or if you like, this thing is no longer constructible on on the round space of X, but rather on the round space of X where you carve out some circle. Uh, also, so it's has a slightly more complicated alteration. So that's trying to be local operators in Prince Simon's theory. Where physicists would probably tell you there aren't any, but then Kevin would say something. Oh, but there are ghosts, um, and and those are the things. It's the ghosts that are generating this C Q and D. Um, you know, I don't feel comfortable talking about ghosts, but uh, yes, uh, that, that is uh, that. Is, this is um this is something which happens in perturbative churn Simons, which I'm informed. Lo looks a little odd to physicists. Sorry, sir. The part where you said that the X is the left hand side, did you say not complement that you're integrating over? Or? No, you're integrating along the knot. I mean, this expression is supposed to be uh, making sense of Witten's original expression. Like it's supposed to be the integral of the trace of Holland element. So that's sort of, you know, think, think of this as sort of being some kind of uh, factorization homology wants to be the analog of Duram cohomology for functional integration. Um, so that's sort of, if you accept that, you know, slogan, then this is attempting to be the like actual expression of like Whitney's uh, version of the Jones polynomial. All right, so that's what I wanted to say about the alpha version. So in the next, uh, when did I start exactly? 13 minutes. 13 minutes, I'll tell you about the beta version. Uh, but first, in order to mo motivate the beta version, I need to trash the algebra version a little bit. Um, so what's wrong with it? So first, this is not always an equivalence. It's sometimes an equivalence. Um, so the red will indicate when it's an equivalence. Why would you want it to be an equivalence? That, that's like what? Yeah. doing a path in a line of space. I mean, you'd like to be able to calculate four votes or who else maybe. Uh, that you'd like to be able to, you know, understand, you know, things which are not perturbative. Well, I'll say in a sec. But so this, this should only be expected to be um, an equivalence 
for instance, in, in physics, when your theory is perturbative. So this is the, uh, a lot of great work has been done by the Kevin Cosgrove School in this. So for, so it's not exactly true that this is an equivalence if the theory is perturbative, but for instance, if you had like a sigma model with an affine target, then it's good. But if the target was not affine, you know, then maybe not. So um, there's been a lot of work on this by Kevin Costello, Owen William, C. Lee, Brian Williams, Chris Elliott, and uh, some of whom are here. Is there one T's or two T's in Elliott? Two T's, got it right. right. Um, and others. Uh, but this stuff just doesn't work. So for instance, down here, this was the, uh, we just got the Shatik and Triath and variance for knots. And you could ask, what about the rest of churn science? What about the Whitner Shatik and Triath and variance of three manifolds? So why would you want to get those? I don't know, we gotta, gotta keep ourselves busy. So that's why you might want something like this map to be an equivalence in order to capture sort of non-perturbative features of your theory in order to say that you're getting the full churn Simons theory and the Whitten Reshiti can drive the variance. So likewise, um, there are interesting examples where this is not an equivalence, and this not being equivalence is related to this theory not being perturbative. Likewise, there are, this is an equivalence um, for certain conditions. And these conditions are not always satisfied. So likewise, you might want some more powerful version of duality, which is more general and applies elsewhere. For instance, for these other kinds. For instance, applies in this setting where this is not an equivalence. Okay, so now that I've trashed the, uh, the alpha theory, I can tell you about the beta theory. So here, in the beta theory, M sub x is the modular space of stratifications of x. And then, the game is to make sense of that. So this should be a moduli space. Think of the Ron space as being a moduli space of point stratifications. This is an extra, just a finite set of points in a space is something really, um, is a really simple example of a stratification. But note that if you think of that, this is, this is a moduli space of point stratifications in which the stratification is allowed to can change in a continuous family as points collide. So you could ask for a similar thing for more general stratifications, where in other words, a path in this moduli space allows one stratification to deform into another stratification. Um, so there are a variety of ways you could attempt to formalize this. For instance, if you were a really point set topological person, then you might say, well, just give me the set of stratifications of x. Put a Ramanian metric on x, and then we'll give it some kind of a Broma Hausdorff topology. And if you were like really uh, comfortable with like potentially gnarly infinite dimensional like um, like topological spaces, that might make you happy. But then you would encounter some issues. Or if you were a more sort of algebra geometrically minded person, you might say, well. I'm only interested in this in order to understand the theory of sheaves on it. And so for that kind of thing, a functor of points point of view might make sense. So let me, uh, so that's the approach we take. We construct this space by constructing its functor of points. So first, let me remind you uh, extremely quickly what a stratified space is. Um, so th these stratifications, think of them as being like triangulations. So I could have put triangulations there, but triangulations are a little too rigid. Um, 
especially thinking about how they perform. So it's better to, to give yourself a little more flexibility. Uh, so strat, the category of stratified spaces, um, this has objects. <coughs> Uh, which are, well, a topological space X, or let me call it yeah, okay, X, together with a continuous map to a poset P, where P carries the poset topology. In other words, for any element P, this is closed. <coughs> um, so in other words, there are strata, X of P, P stratum for every element, little p and big P, and P less than Q has to do with the P uh, stratum being contained in the closure of the Q stratum. So you could essentially just say that you have a bunch of layers which interact like this, and the ordering, um, maybe make each of these strata connected, if you like, and then just give it an ordering by the closure. Um, and the morphisms are stratum preserving. So it's a map X to Y that lies over a map of L sets. So map of the Q. So it's the next diagram. So if two points are in the same stratum and you have a map, they have to again go to the same stratum. It's always the same. So you can consider the collection of all such things, let's call this strat top, you can consider the collection of all such things. Uh, which are closed under a few uh, moves. So let me give, just give you an example of, of one way of creating a new stratified space from an old one. So if A is a stratified topological space, you can consider the cone on X, which is X times an interval modulo uh, collapsing x times 0. And then this maps, if x was indexed by p, this will be mapped indexed by the left cone on p. So in other words, add a new least element to p and send the cone point. <coughs> So um, the basic kinds of features of uh, this category of stratified spaces, uh, well, I'll just say them. I don't have time to write them. Uh, if, if X is a stratified space, then the cone on X is again a stratified space. If X and Y are stratified spaces, then you can take their product, and it's again a stratified space. If X is a stratified space and you have an open inside of it, then the restriction is again a stratified space. And if you have something which has an open cover and everything in the open cover is a stratified space, then the entire space is. So you can take cones, uh, you can take products, and it's local. That's, that's all. So we had to think about what, what is this moduli space going to be like. So the key notion was that of a constructible bundle. And we were really psyched about this idea when we found clarity on it. Uh, so first let me tell you what a weakly constructible bundle is. So if X and K are stratified spaces, then this is a map. And I should say that there's a smooth version of this theory. And the smooth version of this theory takes some doing, and it's spelled out in a, a paper with Hiro Utanaka called Local Structures on Stratified Spaces, and that's the reference here. So a weakly constructible bundle is a map of stratified spaces uh, such that over every stratum, 
case of Q, or we can restrict this to case of Q, and it is a is a fiber bundle. So, in other words, it's locally a product as stratified space. So not only is it a fiber bundle of topological spaces, but in fact the stratification is locally trivial also. So in other words, a, a space is a product. A constructible bundle is a weakly constructible bundle. satisfying an additional condition on links. So for every stratum, you can consider the length of the P stratum in the whole space, and there's a map down to the corresponding link below, where Q is the image of a And this is again required to be a constructible bundle. Now you might say, hey, that's a circular definition, uh, but there you can, there's a notion of depth of singularities, and links have strictly less depth, so you can make this definition well defined in induction. So if depth is zero, then this is just sufficient, because it's just a normal fiber bundle. And then depth one, you've reduced to the case of a normal fiber bundle, and so by induction on depth, this is well defined. So let me give you an example of something which is uh, a, cons a weakly constructible bundle but not constructible. Give me one second. So we can take the stratification of a square and you can collapse down, so this is a resolution of a little singularity, if you like, of a triangle. So this, we have this little blow-up type picture. Um, and so this is an example of something which is weakly constructible, because just look over every stratum in the base, it's locally trivial um, in the space above. Now you can ask, is it constructible? And now let's look at the link around this point right here. The link around this point, well, the link is just the generalization of the sphere bundle. So here the link is that point right there. Now if you take this link right here, that link at that point is just this point right here. So the associated map on links, just from this link to this link, is the inclusion of this point into that interval. And that is not a fiber bundle. So this is weakly constructible but not constructible. So you should think of these constructible bundles as being like flat deformations in, in algebraic geometry. And uh, the key thing that we do is we say that this makes sense. The weekly, yeah. um, so that's all I'll say about the beta version. Thank you all very much. So then there's the moduli space of all stratifications. I would say the moduli space of M, right, if you like, we call this thing fun. And this is a functor, a contravariant functor from strat to homotopy types that sends some stratified, K, stratified space K to all constructible bundles um, over K. Now the, the key theorem is that constructible bundles pull back. <laughs> and that's actually an extremely um, technical thing. You can see that there's a problem right here uh, if we uh, consider the um, pullback of this 
interval mapping in right there and consider this pullback, we would get a picture like that, which according to this definition is no longer a stratified space. So weakly constructible bundles do not pull back, um, but constructible bundles do. And so you get a functor like this. That's the moduli space of all stratifications without a fixed base space. Um, and so you can consider the category of, of arrows in this, which are refinements of a, a fixed space. So then M sub X is sort of, if you like, bun over X, where these arrows are refinements. <coughs> so that's how you get M sub X. Can you say something of what the sort of corresponding property to excision is in the beta version? Uh, yeah. So, um, so what I didn't get a time to talk about is actually this theory is very sensitive to tangential structures on the stratification, more so than the alpha theory. So you get very different kinds of algebraic structure depending on exactly like how, what kind of. Uh, what tangential structure you act on, act, ask for on the k stratum for every k, and how you require that these tangential structures fit together in the stratification. So this is something which is potentially more rigid than usual TFT, but assume that you arrange it uh, so that this is most familiar, then in this case, um, we get a similar expression But the way to interpret this expression is that this is actually a category when x0 is um, an n minus 1 manifold, and these are um, two functors, and you take their co -end. So you get a similar expression. You give them the right tangential structure, and then you can break up everything. Uh, then this is one instance of it. But again, the, it's a descent on this space is something more general. And so you have interesting descent there for like triangulations which are kind of potentially more general than just cutting along co-dimension one and something like this. Can I ask, Andrew, in some talks about constructing words in the TFT using alpha transpositionality, is there something you want to say about data? <laughs> sure, so, um, so the, the analog of this construction, so there are a few things. One is that there's this notion of an infinity n category with adjuncts in which Um, in which you require that every k-morphism has both a left and a right adjoint when k goes from 1 to n minus 1. And so uh, the theorem in progress is that from this you can construct a Cauchy on uh, m sub x where you put the appropriate framing, which is we call a solid n framing. Cauchy roots. So that's what we're in the middle of working on. Um, and if you prove that, then we already have a, a proof of the cavoidism hypothesis from that. So it's that paper's on the archive. It's just sort of sitting there waiting for this thing to be completed. Um, but I think this beta version is, is something substantially more general than the cavoidism hypothesis. So there are lots of, that requires a lot of utilizability and adjoint stuff, whereas this theory, I think, has a lot of traction without the, the strength of those requirements. So the this uh, so I believe that these ideas um, can be made sense of in algebraic geometry. The difference would be greater than <laughs> the RAN space behaves more the same in topology and algebraic geometry. No, no. This, as I've said, it only works in topology, and I believe that there's an algebraic geometric analog, and that's something I am excited to think about one day once the theorem is proper. Alright, well let's thank Sean again.